Hi, thanks for joining. My name is Graham Charters. I'm a senior technical staff member at IBM and I'm the technical product manager responsible for our application runtime. So traditional WebSphere, WebSphere Liberty and Open Liberty. Um, I'm joined today by Alistair Nottingham. He's also a senior technical staff member and he's the lead architect for Open Liberty and the WebSphere chief architect. So he's kind of the, the development uh, twin to, to my product management role. Um, we were originally going to co-present this session, um, but Alistair was on vacation until today. Um, and so we planned uh, planned for uh, me to present and Alistair's joining me to answer any of the difficult questions because he's the technical brains. Okay, uh, so the session today is all about Liberty and its cloud native capabilities. The title says cloud native without compromise. So our goal um, when we uh, evolve Liberty and when we're adding capabilities to help improve the experience in terms of cloud native applications is not to kind of throw out um, some of the, the, the existing value that is also uh, ultimately be beneficial in cloud environments. And, and we'll talk about some of, the, some of those things uh, in the session. So I'm going to talk a bit about futures. Um, so the, the material I'll talk about in Liberty, I'll talk about some of the things we've delivered recently, some of the things we're previewing or doing in beta, and some things that aren't delivered yet. Now, there's no need for a, a non-disclosure agreement or anything for this session because essentially everything I'm going to talk about, we're developing out in open source. Um, but I do need, still need to put a bit of a disclaimer in. So basically, anything I talk about that's futures, um, there's no guarantee or commitment, if you like, that that's going to be delivered. If I give a hint at a kind of timeline or so on, that's just our kind of thinking today. But of course, these things are subject to change. Okay, so what I'd like to do first is talk a bit about uh, about uh, industry and also um, what we hear from our existing uh, WebSphere customers. Um, so we're hearing a lot that the session is about cloud native and when we when we talk to our customers and when you read about uh, uh, about other surveys in the industry, what we hear a lot about is, of course, they they are looking to move to the cloud. They're, they're either already moved uh, many applications to the cloud or are just beginning to start those uh, those journeys. And we survey our customers every year and we ask various questions, but we also ask them about uh, about why they're looking to move to the cloud, what benefits they're hoping to get from the cloud and so on. And number one, um, pretty much just about every time, and number one this year in 2022 uh, was essentially reducing costs. And the argument goes that um, a cloud provider can, uh, can tap into economies of scale. They're providing infrastructure for many, many different, uh, different users. And therefore, they can do it at a much cheaper price and still make a profit at a much cheaper price than than, uh, uh, than enterprises can do themselves in their on-premise on data centers. Um, the number two reason um, that, that customers are looking to move to the cloud is innovation. Um, and so here, that what they're looking to do is reduce costs um, to, so that they can unlock um, uh, additional funds to, to, um, to do more innovation, but also looking to tap into the, the, um, the agility characteristics or the, the, f the fact that uh, cloud environments are much, much easier to, to deliver new capabilities into and also tapping into some of the capabilities that are only really available in cloud and not available in on-premise uh, environments. Um, the other thing we're seeing is that uh, a lot of applications of existing applications are moving to the cloud. Um, in the survey this year, 47% of WebSphere users said uh, said that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, our WebSphere users that uh, responded to the survey said 40%, 47% of their applications are moving to the cloud. Um, they also, and, and this is up from uh, the previous year by 10%, which is a significant, uh, a significant increase. The other thing we're seeing um, when we look at uh, other surveys such as this uh, Institute of Business Value or these two Institute of Business Value surveys is that um, enterprises' abilities to deliver applications for the cloud that are going to exploit the capabilities of the cloud um, are, are, are growing rapidly and also they're delivering a lot more applications directly into the cloud. So essentially building what we call cloud native applications. Um, so you can see here that actually now, the majority of applications, only just the majority, but still a majority of applications are actually being built directly for the cloud. They've never existed on-premise. 
Um, also, skills in, in delivering, uh, delivering cloud native applications are growing rapidly. Um, in the Institute of Business Value C-suite study, um, the CAIOs that responded, uh, the number that said that they have advanced capabilities for doing cloud native development grew by over 400%. And in fact, um, the number that responded that said they had advanced capabilities in cloud, uh, cloud native operations grew, grew by over 300%. And they're not doing this, com companies or enterprises aren't moving to the cloud just for the fun of it, just to, to use somebody else's data center. There's actually a bottom line benefit. And, and in the same Institute of Business Value study, um, they found that uh, comparing high tech adoption uh, companies with uh, non-high tech adoption companies, there's a 6% average revenue benefit. Um, so, so if you're a high tech adopting company, you're gonna, it's going to ultimately uh, increase your, your revenue. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, the industry uh, view around why, why enterprises are adopting cloud, why WebSphere customers are looking to move their applications to the cloud. Um, and, and also uh, around the increase in skills. So it's quite clear that, uh, that cloud native um, is, is essentially becoming mainstream. What I want to do now is talk a little bit about the, the kind of evolution or the history of uh, the WebSphere portfolio and our, our application runtimes to use that to help position or understand the relationship between traditional WebSphere, WebSphere Liberty and Open Liberty, and understand how Liberty is a very different runtime and one that's uh, that's uniquely tailored for, for cloud native applications. And so we've had uh, WebSphere application server for many, many years. Um, in fact, uh, uh, it's uh, I think coming up for 25 years nearly. Um, and it started out as an implementation of what became the Java E specifications and evolved over the years as did the specifications. And where we got to in the kind of 2010 timeframe is we have a monolithic application server for running monolithic applications. And it runs those applications very, very well. We have lots of customers very happy um, running those applications. They, they give, it gives them high throughput. They scale very well to the, to the application needs. Um, but it was quite clear that um, as there was an increased demand for agility in terms of delivering cloud native, or, or sorry, delivering new applications, we needed something different from, from the monolithic application server runtime approach. So what we did is we created Liberty. Liberty is a lightweight kernel. Um, and into that lightweight kernel, you can plug the capabilities that are required by your application. So we could essentially evolve from uh, the, the point of having a, a kind of application server runtime that that supports all applications, and you deploy a number of applications into it, to having an application runtime that supports the the needs of your application that you're creating, which fits very well with where the industry is evolving or has evolved in terms of cloud native applications, microservices, containerized applications. If you think about a, a microservice developed and deployed in a container, you have your microservice application, it's in a container, it's, it's, it serves a specific purpose, and you only want to bring along the runtime capabilities that are required by that application. You don't want any excess bloat, because that's going to cost you in terms of infrastructure. Beyond WebSphere Liberty, we actually um, have a lot of customers that are interested in open source. They're looking to start with open source and then and then have support for that open source. And so we open sourced WebSphere Liberty as Open Liberty. Open Liberty is the upstream open source for WebSphere Liberty. They are binary identical for where the components are are the same. Um, and so customers can deploy Open Liberty in production and get support for that through the WebSphere licenses. And so where that leaves us is we've got two, essentially two runtimes. We have the traditional application server runtime or traditional WebSphere, and we have uh, the Liberty runtime in, in two flavors of WebSphere Liberty and Open Liberty. And the focus um, for our customers is, is different for these, uh, these two different runtimes. So when we talk to customers about traditional WebSphere, they're looking to have stability for their, their applications. They don't want to go through any costly migrations that mean they have to invest in, in evolving those applications when actually the, the applications work perfectly well for them. And of course, we still need to keep the runtime current. We need to update it for database currency, operating system currency, security currency. When we look at what customers are doing and what we we want them to do with Liberty, there are there are two two main roles. One is for creating new cloud native applications. Um, so for, to enable that, we need to support 
containers, Kubernetes, have first class capabilities for those environments. Um, we need to ensure that the runtime is lightweight and efficient because if a, if a, if a customer is going down, uh, if you're going down a microservice, microservices route, you potentially have tens or hundreds more instances. So you don't want to have a full enterprise Java e application server runtime with lots of capabilities you don't need. You want a lightweight and efficient runtime that fits exactly the needs of the application. And we, and we also need to support the latest technologies, latest APIs, and because you're writing new modern applications. Uh, and it may be that uh, when, when, when we say writing new applications, it might be that you have an existing application and you've made the decision to rewrite that application. It's essentially um, creating a new application. The second role for Liberty is as a modernization target. So Liberty, yes, you can customize it to fit exactly the needs of, an app, of a microservice application, but if you need more capabilities, you can include more capabilities, all the way up to full Java E or full Jakarta E or full microprofile capabilities. And that means that it's, it's a great target for modernizing existing applications because you can bring your monolith across from your traditional application server runtime and run that in Liberty. And Liberty also supports multiple versions of APIs um, and you can configure whichever versions you want into the runtime. And so that makes a migration from of an old application to Liberty much easier because there's less, less rework of any API changes that you have to do. So to enable these different uh, different uh, uh, different strategies, if you like, for applications that our customers have, we have an offering called WebSphere Hybrid Edition. Hybrid Edition includes entitlement to traditional WebSphere. It includes entitlement to Liberty. Um, and it also includes tools that help you migrate between traditional WebSphere and Liberty. Um, so you can use the transformation, transformation advisor tool, for example, to analyze your application estate and understand um, what changes might be required in order, if any, in order to, to move to Liberty um, and the cost associated with those. So we have based on practitioner experience, we have advice that uh, helps you understand how many person days effort it might be to migrate an application across. We have Mono to Micro for breaking monolithic applications down into microservices. It uses AI to an analyze uh, a monolithic application and then will uh, define partitions, which you can then adjust, and then it will generate starter microservices for you based on your existing application. And lastly, the WebSphere migration tools, which help you um, do any code changes required to do any migration activities. And then as a complement to WebSphere Hybrid Edition, we have WebSphere Automation. Um, WebSphere Automation uh, essentially takes away all the heavy lifting or the care and feeding, as it says, of a WebSphere uh, deployment. It can be traditional WebSphere environments, it can be Liberty environments. It does things like understand um, the, the patch history and patch levels of your, your deployments so you can uh, you can see if there are any outstanding uh, uh, security vulnerabilities, and then it will, uh, uh, will, based on your guidance, apply those patches for you. Okay, so that's the kind of background. Um, what I want to do now is get into the kind of meat of the session, so talk about WebSphere Liberty, um, and particularly WebSphere Liberty in the context of cloud native applications. Um, and and as I, I say WebSphere Liberty, um, everything I think pretty much everything, and I'll, I'll highlight if it's different, um, also applies to Open Liberty. So if you're an Open Liberty user, an Open Liberty customer, then uh, then these are these are capabilities for you. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to talk about um, some of the things we've done recently, some of the future things. What I'm going to do is is break those down into three themes. Um, so these are three themes that we think uh, are kind of themes that uh, when we talk to our customers that they care about. The first theme is developer delight. So this is all about helping make developers productive. Um, so make it, or making them happy because um, we take away a lot of the tedious activities through our developer experience. So if you're, for example, developing an application, you don't want to be um, forever running builds, rerunning tests and so on, uh, redeploying an application to a runtime just to see whether those changes have, have, uh, have taken effect. Um, but also with the things we're doing are evolving uh, the developer experience to be a first class experience for cloud native application development. So things like being able to develop for containerized environments, um, uh, testing of, of microservices and so on. The second theme is cloud agility. So this is all about helping customers or helping you um, tap into the agility that's provided by the cloud. So 
cloud environments because they provide uh, technologies on tap and make it easier and uh, easier to scale up and scale down more rapidly. Um, there are there are things you need to do if you want to tap into the the agility of the cloud. There are things you need to do in the way you deliver applications. Um, and so the second theme is all about the things that we're doing with Liberty to make it easier and quicker for you to to develop and deploy applications or deliver applications into cloud environments. The third theme is operational efficiency. Efficiency. So this is all about helping you reduce costs. And and in reducing costs, we we mean essentially being able to to um, exploit the the great performance of the Liberty environment um, to essentially reduce the number of instances you need to deploy to support your business needs. Um, and if you're reducing it, the number of instances, then you're you're going some way to achieving potential sustainability goals that you might have. Maybe you're looking to reduce your carbon footprint as an organization. In doing so, we don't want to compromise or, or restrict you from doing certain things. So this is support or capabilities that we're talking about that can work for microservices or monolithic applications, virtual machines, containers, Kubernetes, serverless, and on-premise or in or in cloud environments. We don't want to restrict you um, uh, where these capabilities can be used. Okay, so let's go through the first one, developer delight. Um, so when we look at the developer experience, we, we want to support um, the full end-to-end -end developer experience. Um, and we want to support developers using whatever tools they, they, they prefer. So with our Liberty tools, um, which we just recently, um, we've had um, tools uh, that could plug into Visual Studio Code and IntelliJ for a while. Um, and they were previously called the Liberty Developer Tools. We've just recently renamed those to the Liberty Tools and also just recently released um, uh, equivalent tools uh, for the Eclipse environment. So our, our aim here is to support the leading IDEs, so IntelliJ, Visual Studio Code and Eclipse, but also to support the end-to-end -end life cycle. So we have a starter on, on OpenLiberty.io. If you go to start.openliberty.io, you can generate a new starter project um, it will give you some some initial code to work with, um, and co and configuration for the runtime and a, do a Docker file for building the container image. In terms of writing the actual code, um, we provide content assist um, and configuration assistance um, in in Eclipse, and we're adding these capabilities to the Visual Studio Code and uh, IntelliJ environments as well. Um, and we provide a capability called Dev Mode, which makes it very easy to uh, to rapidly do iterative development. And I'll show on the next slide. Hopefully, if the animation works, I'll show what that looks like. In terms of build, we support the two leading build tools, um, so uh, Maven and Gradle. Um, so you can very easily um, build or, and develop or develop and build applications using uh, the Maven and Gradle plugins. Um, but of course, if you're moving to cloud environments and, and typically maybe moving to containers, um, then you need to be able to build containers. And there are a variety of approaches and we support all the leading approaches. So uh, cl might be cloud native build pack, for example, or source to image if you're going to deploy uh, into OpenShift environment or Docker file or container file if you're using the OCI terminology. In terms of testing, um, we uh, we enable you to be able to do essentially a variety of testing capabilities. So uh, from unit testing to integration testing. But again, if you're going to do cloud native applications, you might want to do testing in containers. So we provide support for testing in containers through test containers. Um, but also if you're doing cloud native microservices and you're going to be exposing APIs to your consumers or consuming APIs from other services, then you want to be able to do contract testing as well. And we, we show how to use contract testing with PACT. And lastly, debug, you want to be able to do hot code replace um, when you're debugging uh, applications. So this, uh, this animation is just showing how dev mode works. So you'll see on the top right uh, top right hand corner um, that there's a, 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 an endpoint we're trying to hit, a, a health endpoint, and that's not available. So what we're doing is we configure in the set middle uh, top part, you'll see we configure the uh, the health feature into the runtime and save the server configuration. And then on the top left-hand corner, what we do is we create a new class, the new health endpoint, uh, and then start writing the code. Uh, in this case, we'll just paste it in. And what happens behind the scenes, when we save the server configuration, dev mode detects that the, uh, the health uh, feature isn't in the runtime, so it goes and downloads and installs that into the runtime. You, you as a developer don't have to do anything. 
And when we create and save the, the new health endpoint class, that's automatically compiled behind the scenes and added into the running server environment. Uh, so the server's been updated with the MicroProfile Health feature, um, the application's been updated with the new class, and then we refresh the browser and you can see the health point endpoint is available. So essentially, you as a developer can focus on writing the code, um, modifying your server configuration you don't have to restart the server you don't have to re you don't have to install anything you don't have to do a rebuild uh, a redeploy or anything you can just focus on the code and dev mode does it all for you and because if you might you know, because many people are developing uh, for containerized deployments and there's a uh, often a goal uh, or it's a best practice to have your development environment match production as much as possible um, dev mode also works in containers to, so what you're seeing here can actually be done with the server itself running inside a container. Okay, in, when you're developing an application, uh, another th key thing that makes you productive for, for developing applications is the APIs you have available. For Since its inception, WebSphere has um, had a, a philosophy of um, supporting standard APIs. Uh, we believe it's the best thing for our customers um, because you can avoid being locked into a particular vendor. And for many, many years, those APIs were Java EE. Now, Java EE was uh, donated to the Eclipse Foundation, and from Java EE has, has emerged uh, Jakarta EE as the, as the, the natural evolution. So essentially, the, the Eclipse standardization, standardization and continuation of the Java EE APIs. And because this has opened up uh, access to, to those APIs and compatibility and so on, uh, the number of products that are now compatible um, with the APIs has grown significantly. So uh, last time I checked, there were 19 compatible products for Jakarta EE. Um, we're in the process and, and of uh, standardizing Jakarta EE 10. And in fact, Jakarta EE 10 as a standard, I think, uh, may now be finalized. And we already have certification for the implementation of Jakarta EE 10 core profile and web profile and full platform will follow. So this is a great path for if you've got existing enterprise applications and you want to modernize those, um, you can move through Jakarta EE. And if you then want to use those in containers and Kubernetes environments and maybe even start breaking those up into microservices, then you can start using the MicroProfile APIs. They are, they are all seamlessly uh, provided together as part of Liberty. Um, so you can start, uh, for example, adding in, as we saw, health endpoints. So you can start reporting health status to Kubernetes, even if you're still running a monolithic uh, application. However, if you're wanting to start doing new microservices, then MicroProfile is the place to start. MicroProfile, again, is standardized as Eclipse. Um, and there are, last time I counted, 14 compatible products for MicroProfile. Um, we've supported MicroProfile since the beginning. You can use MicroProfile to create new microservices. It provides REST API support. Um, it provides the ability to publish APIs through OpenAPI, uh, do health, health endpoints, as I've said, um, output metrics for Prometheus and, and Grafana, uh, and so on. So lots of capabilities are part of the MicroProfile specification. Now, if you want to go beyond MicroProfile, maybe you want to access a database from your microservice, then you can actually pull in pieces from Java EE or Jakarta EE in order to do that. So you can, for example, use MicroProfile and then use JPA from Jakarta EE um, to, to access the database. Okay, um, so we I'll, I'll through the, throughout the presentation just drop in a couple of uh, a co couple of example customers um, where they've uh, they've um, uh, benefit from the capabilities I'm talking about. This particular example, um, Redbridge are a business partner. They worked with a large European bank um, to essentially modernize their Java EE applications. Jakarta EE wasn't available at the time. They containerized those Java EE applications and deployed them into OpenShift and used MicroProfile in the way I described to essentially add in capabilities to help it work better in, the, in that environment. And of course, from there, they can move to Jakarta EE. They can also break those applications down into microservices. Uh, another, another case study um, uh, along the kind of developer delight angle. Uh, this one's from Blue Cross Blue Shield, South Carolina. And what they did is they took an existing enterprise application uh, running on traditional web sphere in virtual machines, and they moved it to Liberty uh, and continued to deploy it in virtual machines initially, but they're looking to go to, to, to OpenShift beyond that. Um, and 
what they found is because the experience was so much better, the developer experience, uh, they did this for one application, then they talked to the other uh, other application owners, and those development teams were were very, very keen to start start adopting Liberty and move their applications across. Okay, so that's the, the developer delight uh, uh, theme. Uh, moving on to cloud agility. So I talked earlier about um, enterprises wanting to, to unlock innovation and deploy applications in a more agile way into a cloud environment. And a key part of this is changing the way you actually deliver applications. If you take an existing application and just lift and shift it into a cloud environment, you're not going to be more agile um, or not not very not in a, uh, any significant way, because you're still going to be deploying the application uh, in the same way, still developing the application and delivering the application in the same way. So what you need to do is essentially evolve how you deliver applications and adopt DevOps practices and continuous integration and continuous delivery to truly unlock the cloud agility. Um, what I'm showing here is the, um, the, the standard, if you like, um, uh, DevOps lifecycle, the eight phases of the DevOps lifecycle. We've talked about um, code build and test, not in, in the context of this lifecycle, but in, in the context of how a developer can, can create those things. Um, so here, the aspect uh, here, what needs to be done is to essentially automate the build, automate the test. So you can start um, writing code, integrating that code in, and kicking off automated builds and tests to understand the quality of, of what you're about to deliver. Beyond that, we need to look at things like deployment and running and monitor. And I'm going to talk about things that we're doing and have done in the deploy and the run uh, run phases. Um, so I'll talk about deploy uh, as part of the cloud agility and then about, and for the operational efficiency, the third theme, I'll talk about run. And so there's lots of things we do uh, with Liberty to enable, enable, um, the, the, uh, enable you to adopt and deliver through, uh, through new uh, DevOps practices. Um, but there are also things we do just in the way we deliver the runtime that help you um, uh, help you be more agile in your delivery. So things like um, zero migration. Uh, zero migration essentially says we won't change the behavior of conf your server configuration and we won't change the behavior of your APIs and we won't take your APIs away from you. So if you have an application that you've delivered through this lifecycle, um, you can update the Lib Liberty runtime underneath that application and it should just work. And if it doesn't, then you can open a support ticket and we will fix it. Um, and the other thing we do is we, we release Liberty on a, on a very frequent uh, and reliable schedule. So essentially every four weeks we could produce a new release of Liberty through our continuous delivery model. Um, and that release includes the fixes from the previous release. So now if you're doing continuous delivery in DevOps, you can pick up the latest release of Liberty. You don't have to go through any migration exercise and you're gonna, you're gonna pick up the security fixes. You're gonna essentially keep on top of technical debt. And what we find is even with microservices, customers that aren't doing this, that aren't uh, kind of keeping, keeping their runtimes up to date, they end up with a lot of technical debt in those runtimes, which if you're doing microservices um, is multiplied by the number of microservices you have. So in terms of deployment, um, when we talk to customers, um, one of the challenges they have is from an operational perspective, they're skilled in virtual machines, they're skilled in traditional web sphere, they're, they're perhaps skilled in Liberty, um, but they, as they move to the cloud, they're not skilled in necessarily particularly skilled in containers and Kubernetes. So a lot of what we do is aimed at closing that skills gap, essentially making your life as simple as possible for deploying and managing Liberty microservices or Liberty applications in a cloud and Kubernetes environment. And Liberty operators are the things that uh, things that uh, uh, really en really enable that. So Kubernetes itself is a very kind of generic uh, capability. It essentially lets you deploy and manage containers, but it doesn't really know anything about the, what's inside those containers. And what we can do is through through uh, what are called op operators, you can essentially provide extensions to the Kubernetes environment or the Kubernetes runtime. So with the Liberty operators, they essentially teach Kubernetes about Liberty applications. They make it much simpler to they, to to configure a deployment of a of a Liberty application. So you can see in the bottom right hand uh, right hand corner an example of configuration for deploying a Liberty application. Um, and you can see there are things in there that are that are specific to to Liberty applications. So through an operator, 
you can essentially define a deployment. It, it will the operator simplifies the common tasks. So deploying and scaling and up, upgrading applications. It will in in, in uh, an OpenShift environment. It'll do auto automatic uh, upgrade for you. In Kubernetes, you can take advantage of the rolling update upgrade capabilities in Kubernetes. It will help you do things like gathering dumps. So common tasks are very very easy now, rather than through the the generic Kubernetes capability. It also provides security out of the box. So for, exa for example, end-to-end -end encryption of the communications between the various uh, elements it lays down into the, into the Kubernetes environment. And, and in doing so, it taps into the default certificate management in the environment, uh, certificate manager in the environment it finds itself in. Um, I talked about the, the configuration being much simpler and actually it reduces the amount of configuration you have to provide. So I, I developed an example for a, state, a stateful application that had session affinity uh, load balancing. And when I did that using uh, Kubernetes deployment, uh, deployment YAML, it required about 100 lines of code. And when I did it using the Liberty operator, it required, uh, sorry, 100 lines of YAML. And when I did it using the Kubernetes operator, it required about 20 lines of YAML. So you're writing uh, much less configuration. That configuration is much more, uh, is specific to the environment, uh, to the to the Liberty application deployment, and so it's going to be less error prone uh, and much easier to do. Uh, and in terms of recent developments, we've we've had an Open Liberty operator for a while that lets you deploy Open Liberty and WebSphere Liberty applications. We've just recently released a WebSphere Liberty operator that again lets you deploy WebSphere Liberty and Open Liberty, but it helps you do that in a supported way. So it will uh, add the configuration to the deployments that's that's required for doing entitlement tracking through through the simple configuration that we show on the right hand side. When I talk to customers, um, they're looking to use a variety of cloud environments. They're also looking to use a variety of virtualization technologies or, or platforms in those cloud environments. And I often get questions about, well, uh, is Liberty supported in those environments? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. So we support Liberty in all leading clouds. So Azure, AWS, IBM Cloud, Google Cloud, and so on. Um, and we also support Liberty in, in leading virtualization technology. So in virtual machines and containers, and you can deploy into Kubernetes, you can deploy into OpenShift and so on. Um, the other thing when we're talking to customers um, is we hear that some are, are looking to kind of uh, start using um, serverless capabilities. And most recently we have had a, a number of customers asking about uh, ECS Fargate. And we've just added support for ECS Fargate for deploying Liberty and traditional web server application servers into those environments. So this is it's still containerized environments. It's still deploying containers, but it's serverless because you're not managing the underlying platform. You're not managing a Kubernetes environment. Essentially, you provide um, configuration that says I, I want the following uh, following characteristics for my deployment, and and the uh, ECS environment does it for you. If you're interested in containers as a service environment, so maybe you're looking at IBM Code Engine or looking at Azure Container Apps, then please get in touch with us. We'd love to love to kind of work with you on on uh, addressing those needs. The other thing we're doing for cloud environments is um, simplifying setting up the environment in the first place. So if you choose to to use something like uh, uh, Azure Kubernetes Service or Azure uh, Azure Red Hat OpenShift. You can you can stand up an, uh, a managed environment in in the Azure cloud, but then you need to um, sort out any networking you need to do. Uh, you need to install the operators, and then maybe maybe um, uh, understand how to then deploy using the operator the the uh, the application. What we do with uh, or what we've been doing in collaboration with Microsoft is we've provided marketplace entries that do all that initial setup for you. So they they take away all that heavy lifting. So you can. From the beginning, um, just by filling out a, f a few fields, um, you can get a, a, a Kubernetes environment provisioned. You get a, a container registry, get it all set up with the, with the uh, the operator um, already installed and configured, and, and you're ready to go with your deployments. We're also starting working with uh, with Amazon on AWS. Um, so in this environment, we're working on a quick start that will will essentially do an initial setup very similar to what we have in Azure. Um, enabling that through a quick start in the in the, uh, in the uh, Amazon cloud. 
Okay, um, on the cloud agility side of things, I just wanted to um, give another example, uh, another case study example. So this is, uh, again, another business partner, Flow Factor. They worked with a European transportation company. Uh, and, uh, and what they were doing is uh, modernizing their applications to Liberty into an open shift environment. Um, and they did that. Uh, and at the same time as modernizing the applications, they also introduced uh, automation. So as I said, uh, adopting DevOps automation practices to, to really tap into that agility. And what they found is that um, they, they went from kind of full deployment life cycle or full deployment cycle times that were measured in months um, down to deployment cycles measure, measured in uh, one or two hours. Um, and this was essentially an over 99% uh, improvement in, in uh, deployment times. Okay, third, uh, third theme, operational efficiency. So since, since we first really started with WebSphere, we've, we, we've worked very hard to make sure that WebSphere is a very good runtime in terms of performance, uh, so very competitive. Um, this has been important for many, many years, and it's important to customers because um, the better the runtime in terms of its, its being frugal uh, in terms of memory footprint and, and also having high throughput, the fewer instances you need to deploy. So that's going to um, reduce infrastructure costs, reduce license costs, and also help well help with sustainability goals, which we, uh, we, we need to care about more and more over time. Um, and the same is true for Liberty. Uh, and, we, and Liberty is a very, very, uh, very, very um, uh, good runtime in terms of performance. We we continually compare Liberty against other runtimes. Liberty can run, a, as, as I've said, a variety of, of different uh, 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 types of applications, full Java e applications, microprofile applications. It even runs Spring Boot applications. And so we're able to do benchmarks against uh, a variety of different runtimes. So here the benchmark we have is, uh, uh, or the benchmarks we've used are for the Java, uh, sorry, JBoss and Tommy E. Um, uh, runtimes we use a Java E application. For Quarkus, um, it's a microprofile application that was written in conjunction with a customer. Um, so it's a it's a, a, an example, exemplar uh, banking application. And for Spring Boot, it's the Spring Boot Pet Clinic uh, application. So Spring Boot on Tomcat versus Spring Boot on Liberty. And you can see that in, in all cases, we do very well on throughput. And we also do extremely well in terms of memory footprint. But as we move to the cloud and as customers are looking to adopt the agility of the cloud, and maybe they're looking at, uh, at serverless capabilities, um, different things come into focus or different performance things come into focus. Now, throughput and memory usage are still incredibly important. Um, they will still save a great deal of money when you do cloud deployments. But if, for example, you're looking to do um, deployments into a serverless environment, in serverless environments, they, they allow you to choose if you want to scale down to zero. Um, so, and if you scale down to zero and you get a request that comes in, you need your application to start and respond very, very quickly. Otherwise, you're going to either time out or your, your customers are not going to be particularly happy with the response times or the consumers of your service are not going to be particularly happy. And um, and also, um, if you need to scale up rapidly, even if you've not scaled down to zero, if you need to scale up rapidly, you want to be able to add new instances very, very quickly that are going to respond to requests very, very quickly. Um, and what we've seen um, for uh, for other runtimes is they've um, they're, they're looking at things like um, uh, native compilation to give you that fast start time. However, native compilation has a number of downsides. Native compilation. It means that when you go into production, you're, you're using a native compiled image. You're not running on a JVM. And JVMs have been optimized for performance in, in, in running environments over many, many, many years. And so the performance of running on a JVM is much better, or the throughput running on a JVM is much better than running a native image. Another downside is I talked about having developer prod parity, so having the same environment in development as you have in production. Native image compilation takes time. It's not something that can be done um, as part of your developer experience. So a developer, a developer will typically or will invariably develop on a JVM, and then you build the native image in, in you know, build time and go into production on native image. So you have a difference between your development environment and your production environment. Um, and there are, there are other, other things such as uh, language limitations. So uh, native image compilation doesn't support all the J Java APIs. With Liberty, what we're doing is we're taking a different approach. 
Um, so we're tapping into something um, which enables us to uh, essentially take a, a snapshot or a checkpoint, if you like, of a running application. And so, and in doing so, we we um, uh, so we take a checkpoint, and then you can restore that checkpoint in production. So when you do the restore in production, the the thing that you're restoring has already gone through um, any any initialization and any any other activity that was done before that checkpoint was taken. So this means that um, in your build environment, you can start up, for example, the Liberty runtime and start your deployed application in that runtime, take your checkpoint. And then when you restore that in production, you've got a, a, a runtime that's already started. The restore comes very, very quick, happens very, very quickly. The runtime started, the application's already deployed and started, and it can start responding to, respond, uh, to requests very, very quickly. In our tests, um, you can see in the bottom, uh, bottom graph, um, we can get anything from a kind of 12 to 18 times um, uh, improvement in startup time. And applications start in the region of very, very small applications, around 120 odd milliseconds, up to kind of three or 400 milliseconds for full Java E applications. The other thing we're looking at, or the other thing that uh, becomes essentially maybe more obvious in a cloud environment is the memory profile of Java. Um, you can see on the graph at the bottom that um, when, a, when an application starts up, the blue, the blue line in that graph is essentially a, a normal application starting up in a, in, a, uh, in a JVM. And there's a lot of work that goes on, JIT compilation that happens um, during that initial phase that is, is resource intensive. It requires a lot, long, a lot more memory to do that. And then eventually it will reach a, reach a lower steady state. Whereas what we want to be able to do is actually factor out or remove that from our applications because that's costly. You have to give your containers that headroom to support, uh, headroom of memory to support that, that JIT compilation. Now with the, uh, the Semeru Cloud Compiler, um, we, uh, what we can do is we can offload that JIT compilation to a separate process. So say I'm starting up three application instances, um, they can all, um, High, farm off the uh, JIT compilation to the, uh, the Semeru cloud compiler, so they don't have to have that peak memory usage. And, and um, essentially, the savings we get from doing that outweigh uh, any additional memory usage by the Semeru cloud compiler. So we can essentially remove, reduce um, the overall memory requirements for the application deployments. This is something you can do today um, through the Semeru, uh, Semeru Java, um, but you have to manually configure that. Um, and what we're what we're looking to do in the in the not too distant future is enable this very simply through the Liberty operator that I mentioned. So essentially, through a flag, you can say use Semeru Cloud Compiler, and it will stand up an instance of the Cloud Compiler and start using it for the application deployment. Um, another case study in terms of uh, the, the kind of resource benefits of Liberty. Actually, this is this is the uh, the same uh, company that I mentioned earlier, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, South Carolina. Um, I really like this quote. Um, essentially, you know the story. They they uh, migrated an application from traditional WebSphere to Liberty. They were running in virtual machines in both cases, so there aren't any kind of other factors kind of influencing this. And they deployed the application and did some load testing, and they found that they were only using where previously they had eight instances of the traditional application server runtime. They only needed four instances to run the same workload. And, and what I like about this is um, it was such a significant saving. They, they kind of didn't believe the results and they kept rerunning them until they kind of decided, well, yeah, it, it's legitimate. OK, so uh, that's all I want to cover in terms of the, th the, uh, the three themes. I've um, just got a couple more slides if you're uh, interested in finding out more. Um, we have a TEI study that talks about the benefits of Liberty. This is this is uh, a total economic impact study um, done by Forrester. Um, so they did independent research um, working with our, our uh, WebSphere customers on the benefits of Liberty. If you want to try out the instant on capability I talked about, uh, on the right hand side, there's a link to, to a blog post there, which essentially shows you how to use the instant on capability so you can take a uh, an example application that starts in around six and a half seconds um, and use instant on to start it in around three or 400 milliseconds. If you want to find out more in and you like watching videos, there's the, the Liberty TV link. Um, but if you, if you want to join another webinar and actually see instant on in action, um, there's another webinar that's gonna be running on October the 19th at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, and there's the link to go to the registration. 
both this session and that session will be recorded and available for replay. So if you if you're not available to to attend the instant on session, you can go later and uh, and watch it uh, watch it. Okay. Lastly, um, we'd love to hear what you think. We like we like to get feedback. Um, it helps us uh, improve the product uh, and so on and improve your experience. Um, if you've used it and you actually want to tell us how good it is, um, then please email um, Claudia uh, by Ziegle at that, uh, at that email address. If you're interested, if you're a user of, of uh, Liberty and you'd like to kind of, uh, you're interested in authoring blog posts, then, then please again get in touch with us uh, and, and uh, we'd love to work with you on authoring blog posts. Similarly for case, case studies, we're working with a number of customers on case studies. The, the overhead there is not all the, the, the demands on you. We try and minimize. It typically takes about two, hour, two hours. Um, we write the case study. You get to, you get to essentially um, review and approve it, and we, and we do an initial interview there. Uh, and also, if you want to fight, uh, provide feedback, um, and then pre, uh, please, um, you can provide feedback on, on G2, um, on, on your Liberty experiences or your, your general WebSphere experiences. Um, there's also, I think, a, a potential for a monetary reward if you do provide feedback there. Okay, um, that's all I've got. Um, if there are any questions, I don't know whether I can't see the questions tab. So, Alistair, are there any questions? Um, there was one question, which is, uh, do developers need to have a local Docker install for this to work? Or can we point to OpenShift or remote Docker install? And unfortunately, I didn't see the question until um, after you had moved off the subject. So I, I wasn't 100% certain what this referred to, but I assume it's the dev C support. Right, yes. Yeah, that's what I would assume too. And nope. uh, the, dev -C, the dev C support does require a local Docker install. Um, and I did go and check with some of the people that work on it to see whether or not the you because you can use a, a, a local Docker install to then deploy and manage containers that are running on a remote Docker engine. Um, if you get it, if you set this right command line arguments, but uh, we concluded that that wasn't going to be possible in this case because of the way that uh, dev mode for containers works. So that that one does that that uses volume maps in order to ensure that the runtime um, in the container, what's the code in the container, is in sync with the code outside of the container, and that that wouldn't we don't think work across a remote engine. We've never tested it, um, so um, we, it, it is for a local Docker install and a local Docker container. Um, I see another question. It says, is the impression correct that most of the development efforts go to WebSphere Liberty instead of mature? Uh, and I guess that means traditional WebSphere. Um, yes, I think that's, well, it, th that's generally true, yes. But the reason is, uh, the reason that's the case is because, uh, let me just, I don't know if you can still see, this, see the slides. Um, I talked about the different runtimes we have and the roles, uh, roles we have for those runtimes. The vast majority of customers that we talk to about traditional WebSphere, they they don't want us to um, do a new version of Java. They don't want us to do a new version of Jakarta EE. For new applications or for applications where they are looking to um, evolve those applications significantly, they they move them to Liberty or they or they're rewriting applications to Liberty. Um, if we introduced um, a new, if if we did a lot of kind of forward development, if you like, um, to, to do a later level of Java or later level of Jakarta EE, that would introduce significant migrations to all of our customers. Um, and so because the focus on traditional web sphere is stability, um, we, the development effort that we are investing there is focused on supporting that stability case. So uh, continuing to support customers who are running existing applications that are running on Java 8 um, using latest databases, latest operating system levels, latest uh, security capabilities, and so on. So it's not that we're we're not doing forward development. It's just very targeted for that specific use case that most of our customers are telling us they want. Okay. 
Okay, um, if there aren't any other questions, um, then I think we can wrap things up. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Um, I appreciate you you listening. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch, um, please reach out to us. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Bye bye.